So uh, I'm sure some of you are very familiar with the term fourth industrial revolution, and for some of you it might be um, a very a, a very new term. Essentially, it's a term that was coined by the uh, World Economic Forum and that looks at those historic uh, industrial evolutions from steam to electricity to electronics and now in the space of uh, cyber physical systems. So what cyber phys physical systems are, there's a, it's a really good, there's lots of different kind of ways of describing them, but um, one that I quite like, which has come from Salesforce, and so I'm, I'll try and look down the camera, but I'll also be looking at some notes in my hands. Um, it's a way of describing the blurring of boundaries between the physical, digital and biological worlds. It's a, a fusion of advances in artificial intelligence, robotics, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, genetic engineering, quantum computing and other technologies. And so this idea of, um, which we're starting to already see in terms of convergence, and that might be your Apple Mac watch, um, talking to an app that's, uh, that's measuring your heart rate. And then that, might, that, that, is, that is already progressing to different types of technology that we'll have inserted into our bodies and how that will talk to the rest of the, the, the you know, whether it's the internet or other space, other, um, spaces around your house and so on and but the big pieces are data artificial intelligence and and digitization and the internet of things there are a couple of big themes that um, straight away emerge from this this new uh, this new future that we call it you know that is already upon us and uh, um, and and that is already playing out and one of them is digital inequity and the way I think about this is there's a piece around access and there's also a piece around um, in terms of access to to both the hardware. Oops, sorry, lights have gone off here. Um, there's the in terms of, uh, so for instance, we saw that even with COVID and um, the shift to online learning. Uh, what, what became apparent really quickly for the Department of Education here in Victoria is that there are heaps of kids not only with no access to laptops, but also no access to broadband. So thinking about uh, equity of access in terms of the, um, the, the, you know, the hardware and the capability, whether it's broadband, whether it's uh, ability to, to buy apps and so on, but also in terms of globally uh, equi e equity in terms of uh, gender and in terms of socioeconomic, uh, um, your, your socioeconomic status. And then the other piece I think that is important here is your literacy, your digital literacy as well. So, the and the, the other and literacy is important because I think the key thing that will distinguish people over for people will be uh, whether or not you're going to be just passive consumers of of the digital world or whether you're going to actually be makers and and creators of it. The other piece that you you certainly I'm sure have started to hear conversations about is is the nexus between uh, the future of technology, human rights, and AI, and uh, in particular uh, this question around the ethics whether or not we can insert within artificial intelligence and and its decision making capability. Uh, an, a human rights framework or an or an ethics framework, and, and um, I will send some resources around after this. That and there's a particular paper around dignity in AI, and it really struck me when I was reading this paper that um, I was reflecting on on the work of CLCs, and, and in so many ways, to me, every single day you work, you are focused on providing people with dignity around you know, access around having a voice around starting to have some control. And uh, what I think is important to think about is, well, how do we translate that into the digital space? So how do you start to bring um, a transparency to the way in which AIs are, uh, are created and, and the decisions that they make or the assumptions that underpin them? 
The reason why I've put this text up uh, is partly partly because I know on the phone there are a lot of lawyers and 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 this uh, this uh, draft this is draft text. This is a discussion that's happening. Uh, currently uh, with UNESCO. There was a, a conference just recently, just a couple of weeks ago in Japan, hosted by the World Economic Forum on the governance of technology. And, these, and, and there's also a process that the Australian Human Rights Commission is currently, they've gone through quite a big consultation process to think through uh, what, what are the implications of um, the fourth industrial revolution or cyber physical systems? And then what are the kind of legal and regulatory framework, uh, the principles that should, that should underpin that? And so I think I, I particularly wanted to emphasize that this, this is a discussion that right now is, is kind of really starting to um, uh, get momentum because uh, the, 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 the sector, the federation, uh, individual CLCs have done such a good job at advocating around systemic issues. And for me, this is, and, and really advocating on those policy issues. And for me, this is, there is a really important uh, conversation that CLCs need to be part of, which is how do you, how do you embed a human rights framework? How do you embed dignity in, 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 in AI and and in digital development and and bake it in from the from the outset. The other big theme uh, that we've been grappling with is this idea of um, technology really as a weapon, and then and then the flip side of that um, uh, around as a shield as well. And I think. Um, one of the things that uh, you know you will have seen in the news a lot and we grappled with quite a lot within the department was the regulatory and legal environment for something like uh, uh, sexual assault uh, that happens um, that is facilitated through digital platforms and, it, and it's a really really tricky environment and that's probably one of the things that I wanted to reflect on is actually that challenge of uh, where the, the regulatory and legal environment, it's, it's very complex. It goes across multiple jurisdictions, global, federal, state. Uh, it goes across multiple areas of law. And, and just even from that perspective of clients coming into you and saying, I've had this experience, uh, whether it's online harassment or sexual assault or, you know, and, and or, um, you know, be, I've been denied health insurance thinking through all of the legal ramifications and what that's going to mean for you as advisors and supporters of, of those citizens. The last big theme is how we work uh, and who gets the work. And, and I mean, this is going to play out for you in the context of both um, uh, your client base in terms of the impact uh, on, on jobs and employment and, and uh, economic um, stability, but also what I think is really exciting is actually how you deliver services and what this means for in terms of, so you hear a lot of people talk about robots are going to take our jobs, but there's actually a really positive, there's a positive element, there's a flip way you can turn that story around, around automating the work that is really repetitive and monotonous and there's a great um, uh, uh, there's a great kind of automated form process uh, that called joseph.com that uh, the Tenancy Union, Union, for instance, has used to assist clients to write letters to their landlords, which means then that your lawyers can spend more time with focused in on their clients, giving more intense dosage and, and, and being able to spend more time with them because they're not uh, spending time on the back end. So that is a very whistle top uh, tour through uh, everything that, you know, there's a lot to absorb around um, the future of technology. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of impact on CLCs around your client base and their needs, working within a changing legal system. I mean, we've already seen that over the last year um, and, and changing the way that you work with your clients, with the system and with each other. I think for me, the big pieces are about um, understanding what's coming, getting informed, really thinking about the opportunities as well as the challenges in terms of how it can free up your front line, but also thinking through what is it that we, what is 
What is it that we do that really needs that human interaction? But the last thing I'd probably leave you with, and just reflecting on Emma talking about the social services 10-year plan is, actually don't think about digital and, and technology as something separate. Actually think through what you want to achieve and then what's the digital component that sits underneath that. And, and thinking through that um, it doesn't need to be a separate uh, consideration. It could be embedded in everything you want to achieve over the next 10 years. So I'm really conscious I've ripped through a lot of stuff there. There's some amazing people like Chris and Kate who can probably do a much better job of articulating what this might look like for the Community Legal Centre. And this is something I'm super passionate about. So always happy to um, have uh, side chats on any of this in terms of how it might impact what you do and, 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 the, uh, and both from a positive and potentially from a challenging side and but also enhance and um, amplify the impact that you have too. So thank you, Serena.